So today uh, I'm doing an intro video for the uh, fourth lesson on Drawbox. That's uh, drawing insects and arachnids. Just like before, this is not a full lesson. This is just an introduction to go over some basic concepts. The full lesson is here on Drawbox.com. Make sure that you read all the instructions. I know that it's pretty long-winded. I tend to ramble on a lot, but the information tends to be fairly important, and it will help you along your way. Uh, later this afternoon I'm planning on redoing some of these older demos. Um, while I've been, I mean I've been doing critiques for this sort of thing for just over two years now and I've learned a lot about how people think, how people learn, and how best to approach this material. Since I understood it in a specific way when I learned it, but I wasn't, it's not like I could put it to words at the time. So through doing all of these critiques, I've learned different kind of the specifics as to even how I think about going through this material. So hopefully the new demos and this video will be more, well, hopefully they'll be better uh, targeted at this material. But I'm probably, looking at these demos, I'm probably going to leave them up as well because <clears throat> unlike... Uh, the last lesson where I think my demos and my general approach was a little less constructive. Here they actually do follow through that kind of approach a little better, but the new ones will be more relevant, more on point, and so on. So last time I talked about when dealing with plants, I talked about how we're still constructing with the three different groups of forms and everything technically has a basis in standard geometric forms like cylinders Spheres, ah, that's kind of terrible, but whatever, uh, boxes, and so on. And then from there, you can kind of extend it into organic forms, which are pretty much, they're very similar, and you can technically take geometric forms and twist them and turn them and manipulate them to such an extent that they stop holding some of the characteristics of being geometric forms, and they become much more organic. Like this is the most basic kind of way of thinking about it where a tube just becomes so soft and malleable that it eventually becomes a sort of sausage-like form, which tend to be very useful. And we focus on those in uh, lesson two. And then the third group, which I mentioned in the last lesson, was the ribbons. And these were especially relevant last time because they behave, I mean, it's pretty much what we look at for leaves, which are, they're, they're both just flat shapes that flow through three dimensions as opposed to just across the two-dimensional canvas or page that you're drawing on. Now, in this lesson, this is all still relevant, but we are mainly going to be looking at the organic forms. Um, in some ways, I guess you could be seeing it, at, uh, I mean, seeing some geometric, but it's mostly going to be balls or spheres, which are pretty much organic as well. That's sort of the overlap between the different groups. Additionally, you might play a little bit with, uh, if you're looking at like wasp or fly wings, those are flat, so then you look more into the uh, the ribbons and that sort of thing, but 90% of what we're looking at here are organic forms. And you always want to remember that you want to keep those simple and solid. So if you're drawing a sausage like this, these sort of pinches and swelling and whatnot, it, it doesn't look good. It doesn't It's not just that it doesn't look good, it's that it undermines the solidity of the whole form. So you can, you can add contour curves to it to kind of reinforce that, but you're already starting off with something that's 
sacrificed some of its solidity. So you can work with it, but it's still going to look weak, and it's not a great starting point. So instead, always work with a nice, smooth, even line. Try and keep your widths consistent. And I mean, you'll have a little bit of tapering or whatever if you're thinking in perspective. But for the most part, that's not going to be a big deal here because perspective tends to apply more to larger objects at a larger scale. When you're looking at a much smaller form, there's so little perspective because the distance between the closer point and the farther point is so minimal that the sizes don't really change. So what I usually uh, describe the opposite as is when you're looking at a building from the bottom floor, or the roof of a building from the bottom floor, the scale here is enormous. So you're going to be seeing something like that, where the roof is tiny relative to the base where you're standing. So here we're, look, we're talking about insects. These are small objects, so there's not going to be a whole lot of perspective distortion. So again, just simple sausage shapes, balls, you know, and the balls don't have to be spheres, they can be squished. And remember your contour lines. The thing about insects that's quite good is that these, um, they have exoskeletons, meaning that they have their really hard, dense armor plates on the outside as opposed to us having our bones and skeletons on the inside. And the benefit here is that in order to stay mobile, it's got a lot of segmentation between these sort of plates of bone and armor. And so this segmentation basically gives us some natural contour lines to work from. So if you think about a wasp, I'm not looking at any reference right now, but... So a wasp's body, forget about its head for now, but it's something like this. And the uh, abdomen here, we'll talk about the different terms for their anatomy in a bit, but their actual abdomen has this sort of ribbing to it. And it becomes super useful to use that to help describe how the form turns through space. And so, and any sort of lines that run along the surface, even if they're not just running like this, if they run maybe a little around like that, as long as in your mind it's like you're carving your pen along the surface of that form and not just straight across, you'll start to get the little bits of nuance that help describe how the form sits in space and how that surface wraps around your form. So let's talk about the anatomy of insects first, or insects and arachnids. So here you've got a human torso. And surprisingly enough, we are actually quite similar in the way that at least our heads and torsos, are, and arms I guess, are structured relative to uh, these other creatures. So you've got, I didn't draw any of these from reference, it wasn't really uh, an informed design, but something wasp-like, something beetle-like, and something spider-like. And so you've got three main components for each of these, although the spider is a special case that we'll talk about later. You've got the head, the thorax, which for us we think of as the chest, and you've got the abdomen. And so each of these insects or arachnids is also broken up into similar components. Now as you move from something like an ant or a wasp towards a beetle and then finally to a uh, spider or a scorpion or whatever other arachnid you're talking about, your the distance and the, the or rather the closeness 
between the head and the thorax will increase. And once you reach this point, you no longer have an independent head and thorax that can kind of pivot relative to each other. So the wasp can turn its head no problem. The spider, its head is actually fused into its thorax, and it's now called, I mean, the name isn't that important, but it's called a cephalothorax. The beetle can still turn its head around, but it's not quite as disjointed from the rest of it as it would be for an ant or a uh, wasp or a bee or whatever. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that your legs, while, like, with a beetle, it's easy to think that the legs, the bottom legs come out of the abdomen, but that's not true. Think of them as being like a human upper torso. Your arms come out of your shoulders, which are at the side of your chest-ish. Like, the muscle actually wraps around from the chest to the arm. So for these insects, they have a similar structure where their legs, all of them, come out of the thorax. And so it's really important to actually give some thought as to how your legs connect to the rest of the body. So if your thorax and your head are like this, Usually the back legs are very close to the abdomen and it's going to look like they are actually coming out from here, but always keep in mind that they're generally going to come out from the thorax. Now, I'm not an entomologist, I could be wrong on some points, but it's a good rule of thumb that your legs are generally going to come out of your thorax. Just don't quote me on it if you're actually talking to an entomologist because they might call me an idiot. Anyway. Um, moving on, is there anything else more to cover on this? No, that's good. So this is a ladybug, as many of you probably know. I think they're probably called something different in some countries. Sometimes they're called ladybirds, it doesn't really matter, it's very beetle-like. So the first thing that I want to point out is the basic forms that make up the body. And here it's super simple. You've got three, three major forms. And I'm not really sure which color to pick here because they all kind of blend in with this picture. But I'll do my best. So you've got the abdomen here, which is massive and takes up the majority of the body. And then you've got the thorax. And you've got all of these little legs coming out of the thorax, even this one here. A lot of the time, your details are going to be hidden. So you're going to want to look for multiple pieces of reference, maybe study some more anatomical you know, drawings or diagrams of how these things fit together, because you're not always going to want to rely on just a single image. You want to understand how things come together. You might want to ultimately draw that image, but it's hiding a lot of information from you. You need to fill in those blanks for yourself so you understand how it all comes together. Lastly, you've got the head. Now, notice that um, I, for this abdomen, I drew the entire friggin' ball. There's a form here that gets cut off, which is the shell, but it wraps right around a larger form. And so, I don't want to get distracted by this slightly more complex form with its little, like, curves and how it wraps around. Balls are simple, they're solid, I want to build a solid base for my construction. That's all I'm focusing on. It's like when you're building a, uh, a clay sculpture, or I don't actually know that much about sculpting, but I know that you want to block things out first, and then refine the forms around them, 
always think of your drawing like sculpture, like every form that you're putting down, it's not something you can ignore after the fact. It's there, it's solid, and if you want to change it, you have to carve into it. You have to scoop chunks out of it and add more chunks elsewhere. So what I mean by that is if you start off with a ball like this, you can't then decide, well, I want my form to actually be like this in the next stage. You have to adhere to this. And so on many levels, each step is making certain decisions that you have to stick to. If you decide that you want to change something down the road, you need to consider, okay, what, what solid forms do I need to add to achieve my goal? Because I've already written this in stone, so I need to work around it. I can't just act like, oh wait, that didn't happen, and just ignore it and go my happy way. Because that's going to result in a flimsy construction that is not believable. So just like in the last in the lesson three intro video, I'll show up how like the various steps that this is all constructed. So this matches up directly to that. I've got my abdomen, my thorax, and my head. And you'll also notice that here I added a quick contour line running down the center of the form. And I always find this to be very useful. And you'll actually find, if, you, if I hide this trace layer, you've actually got that mark right there in the ladybug itself. So I rely on this to help keep things aligned and centered because it's basically my my uh, axis of symmetry it also helps keep me aware of the fact that this this is not just some flimsy 2d circle it's an actual ball with mass and form so see how this how right here Instead of just continuing on like that, my curve actually changes and dips down. That's because I'm hinting at an edge here where the surface starts to turn differently at a different rate. And that isn't actually entirely the case here, but it's something that I like to do to exaggerate certain changes, just to remind myself that not everything is running super smooth and consistent. They're all, there are these little turns in form that let you think more about how planes exist. So in this case, I might be thinking of well, most of this shell is actually very rounded, so I don't want to make it too planar. But So this might be one sort of consistent curve, or a curved plane. And then this little lip here is different. And it's not significantly different, but I want to be aware of it in my mind. Other beetles and things, you might have them... Or that's a bad example. Um, they might have a lot more going on in terms of their top and side faces. So see how this turns here? That's what we're thinking about. So this is the side plane, this is the top plane. So once I've built that out, I want to move on to refining my big forms. So the shell that I was talking about beforehand now I feel confident in constructing it around my ball. So because it's wrapping around this form, the scaffolding that already exists. So I'm just adding along my contour, like just building up along the contour of the form. And I've got a little bit of a protrusion here because it's got a tiny lip. And you'll notice that this ball actually ex extends a below where the uh, the belly of the uh, the ladybug goes, but we'll carve that out later. It's not a big deal right now. And actually, I also... So there's not just this shell, but there's also 
this color is getting useless. There's a lot of different components that are meshed into each other, so you need to be aware of that. This head is set into the thorax, and it's got this little hinge joint type thing. Or not hinge joint, it's a ball joint, but we'll get into that some other time. So I want to make sure that all these overlapping parts, that I've got them well defined, like this, so I know how all the parts fit together. That's really the overarching theme here. Everything is constructed in a certain way that allows it to behave the way it does. It allows its head to turn in certain circumstances or the opposite. It doesn't allow its head to turn. And so every object, its essence exists because of the way that it's constructed. I don't know how else to describe that. So you need to be aware of how everything fits together, otherwise your construction simply won't be believable. Now, here I'm thinking about how my legs connect. Now, like I said, in this image you get none of that information. They just go into some shadowy depths and magically connect to the body. That's not good enough. So you want to go and find other references explaining exactly, or visually explaining at least, how these things connect to the thorax or whatever part of the body they may connect to. And you also want to think about what's going on on the opposite side. I can't see any of that, but eventually I'm going to have to think about how at least one leg is poking out or whatever. So I want to know how these f shapes or forms are actually extending out of the body so that I can build up my mental model of this whole construction in 3D in my head. So you'll notice that here I, I've i got the joints. You can think of it as the joints fitting into the... Uh, like, I mean, you might think that those are going to the abdomen, but the thorax likely extends deeper in there. And this is actually being tucked underneath the shell. So it's like we're looking at it with x-ray glasses. So while the position may line up with the abdomen, you'll see this actually better in the next example, but it's still connecting to the thorax. So long story short, what you see on the surface is not always what's actually going on. Although, admittedly, I think I might have actually put this a little bit too far back, but whatever. So, then you build out your legs, and when constructing legs, a lot of people want to start off with uh, simple lines. And then flesh them out. And, I mean, I guess it's okay, but I've seen some varying levels of success with this. Personally, I prefer to forget the lines, and I actually, in my previous demos, I used lines, which is why a lot of people seem to be doing the same thing, but I've learned since then that building out legs like little sausages, and with these things you don't really have to care that much about how much form is going into it, I mean, it's good to know how each part connects with the other one and curving into each socket. But generally, I want to focus much more on the gesture and the flow of these things. So you'll, you'll know that I'm not drawing rigid, stiff lines. All my legs are always curving like this. That was actually a bad example. It's the other way. Or whatever. And so when I build out my legs, it's just connecting one form to the next, to the next. And also take a close look at, I mean, always look closely at your reference. You should never be drawing more than a couple moments between glances at your reference. But pay special attention to the just how these legs are constructed. How many segments do they have? And what's going on at the end of them? Like this one's got a little toe thing. 
And especially with insects, like I'm obviously doing a simplification here, which is good for construction, but later on you'll want to refine that to better reflect what the actual masses, like what their relationships are. Because you can see here, the joint here is actually, it's very peculiar. See how it gets very narrow here? I'm, I personally hate that because it makes the construction aspect of it, making things feel solid and sturdy, much more difficult. But at the end of the day, you can't make stuff up. I mean, you can if you want to, but that's what we like to call artistic license, where you alter the design of a thing to better suit your needs. But in this case, we're just focusing on capturing what is actually there and understanding it. We've got this weird segmentation going on and stupid little toes. So be aware of what it is you're actually drawing. Don't just lose yourself in your own head. And lastly, I just start refining things. And I like, just like in the plants, I like to uh, refine my shapes and just break things, break my shapes apart and organize them by filling some things in with solid black. Just like here, you can't see a lot of that detail. It helps to separate it, um, those legs out from the underbody and from the shell and all that, just to make them exist as their own separate entity. And adding line weight and all that stuff to separate out your forms is also very helpful. And lastly, I usually like to add a simple little shadow shape. I mean, this is really poorly constructed. I don't put a whole lot of time into them, ever because it's not really worth it. It's just to have something on the ground there to show that there is a ground plane here, that this creature is not just floating in air. Anyway, I have one last demo to show you, and I want to try and get through this quickly because we're already running fairly long. It's a tarantula. I was looking for different spiders to use uh, for a an example, but they all unsettle me deeply. Tarantulas I can deal with at least a little bit, so yeah, but I, I'm just gonna try and get through this as quickly as I can. So again, three basic forms, your abdomen, your thorax, and your head, and like before, the cephalothorax is the fused, not like before, but like in my anatomy, explanation. The cephalothorax is the fused head and uh, thorax, which does not allow the head to pivot at all. And it's fused to such a degree that they are basically the same form. It's like the thorax has a little bump on it, but you should still block them in separately. Because even a bump adds an extra level of complexity to your form. And so that's my basic construction of the body. And uh, like before, I have that center line coming along here to help orient the whole construction and figure out how things are going to be aligned. Here, I noticed that I'll hide the little tracing layer, but this, it's got a little carapace here. God, that was creepy. And so I wanted to at least try and add an extra layer of form up there for now. It's quite interesting, actually, that it's got an extra layer that seems to cover the thorax portion of the cephalothorax, and the head is exposed. And that's all part of its... I mean, th these little edges here are just more contour lines that describe how the form flows, which is very useful. Next, find those leg joints again. Here we've got four legs on each side. And then also these two, I don't really remember what they are. They're stupid little, I always refer to these things as stupid because I hate insects and arachnids. But they've got these little grabby things that they use to eat with. I don't know. I'm not a freaking scientist. 
But anyways, all of these things have joints, and so you need to be aware of how they connect to the body. And this will come up time and time again. It's important here. It's important when you draw plants. It's super important when you draw animals, and people tend to forget that. They, well, whatever. And so here are the legs. And just like before, I don't draw a line coming through here. I draw the forms themselves, the little noodles. Noodles and sausages, all these things are about food. And I haven't had lunch. And so here we just want to be aware of the fact that they are overlapping each other and connected to one another and so on. And I mean, it. I guarantee you the first several times you're probably going to screw up the leg arrangement because they're just so long and gangly. So you just really need to practice observation. So beyond a certain point with your proportions, with the way things are laid out, it's just something you need to get used to doing. If you look away from your reference for too long, and by too long I mean like five, six seconds, you're going to forget things. Your brain tries to process the information and in processing it, it throws away a lot of stuff that it doesn't think is important. And it's all important because we want to capture reality. And so you're going to start throwing really important stuff away and then that's eventually that gets broken down into what we think of as drawing icons and drawing symbols. They, they represent the object that we're trying to draw, but they don't actually accurately capture what's there. So always look at your reference constantly. Remember that your memory cannot be trusted. It's that simple. So once I added those legs, the drawing was getting a little messy. So I started to add a lot more line weights to kind of capture the, uh, not capture, but define the overlaps of one leg over another or one form over another. So you can see how these leg joints on the far side, they're starting to become a little bit less apparent. They're obviously still there because I'm kind of mimicking drawing ink with ink, but they will not, I mean, they're not going to disappear, but they don't really catch your eye quite as much because everything else draws your attention. And I kind of just push this further. I, I add those shadows that I demonstrated with the ladybug. I just try, it's not about lighting, it's about separating your forms out so that some things get more attention and other things get less attention. It's all about organizing things. And finally, the shadow. Same as before, just a quickly design shape left there. Now there's a lot of texture going on here, and I mean I could talk about that, but I'm not going to, um, because texture's not important. We want to focus entirely on our construction. And so like with the plants in the last lesson, I want to recommend that at least half of your drawings completely ignore any sort of additional texture or detail or any of that stuff. Focus entirely on your major forms, just constructing this recognizable creature. Now, and uh, if you do get into texture, you're probably going to want to depict these sort of hairs as like individual lines, which is a terrible idea, because if I were to add texture to this, And I, if I went about it that way, just adding these lines all over the place, it's going to get so distracting, and sloppy for that matter, and especially, like, I mean, around the silhouette is one thing, but then as you get into here, 
it's just so much visual information. It's very distracting and irritating to look at. So instead of doing that, I'll get more into this particular topic of fur and hair when we get into the next lesson. But for now, when you have a furry surface or a furry object, there's two things you don't want to do. First of all, you don't want to fill the, the entire inside with furry texture, however you want to try and draw it, because it's just going to be full of contrast. It's going to be super distracting. What you should do, on the other hand, is actually add it to the silhouette. So this is still a bad way of doing it, but it's just for example's sake. This is what I was doing before with the spider. This reads way stronger than the equivalent being shoved into here. The reason is, and I've explained this before, but I mean, this whole curriculum is all about me repeating myself over and over and over. But the whole idea is that when you look at an object, the first thing that you see is its silhouette. It's like when you see a friend from a uh, distance. You might know that it's them, even though you can't make out any of the internal detail because there are little things that having gotten to know them and then been with them for a long time, you might know, notice that this is that friend of mine. Certain characteristics, certain details of their silhouette that just makes them recognizable. So when you're designing anything like a character, you need to make sure that their silhouette is highly recognizable. Now, that, that's the first thing that you see, and then gradually your eye looks deeper, it looks into the internal details and textures and like the, the, a person's face and whatever to recognize them. But at every level you're going to get less and less of an impact. So since the silhouette is one of the first levels that the eye looks at, any little detail, any change, anything breaking the edge or breaking the pattern, is really going to stand out. It's going to have a lot of impact. And so, what I always recommend is that you add that detail along the silhouette, but instead of doing it like this where you've just kind of haphazardly drawn a bunch of lines that actually have really irritating tangents to the form itself. You want to specifically design tufts of fur. You want to take your time with this. Don't rush it. Don't be sketchy. Just be purposeful. And save it for key areas as well. You don't have to add this furry texture all over the silhouette. Do it where you know that fur bunches up and becomes very apparent. Just because otherwise you're just doing, you're, it's overkill. And the same thing kind of works for grass and all sorts of other things. So notice how here, the thing I was mentioning about tangents is that it's the idea that a straight line uh, coming perpendicularly off another line will, this point here draws a lot of attention. It creates tension, actually. And it can stress a person out, which is sometimes what you want to do, but usually it's something you want to avoid. And so instead of that, you'll notice how my tufts of fur, they're art. And they're also not singular lines, they're shapes which builds into the whole um, idea of a silhouette being a shape with complex edges. So you just want to work into that. And so these are not creating tangents and they're not as stressful to look at. And you end up with a furrier looking silhouette and once that's applied to a larger form like that spider there
you're able to communicate that part of its characteristics to your viewer. Anyway, I've already hit the 40 minute mark, which is a lot longer than I meant to go. So I'm going to stop this lesson here. Be sure to go over the uh, lesson in its entirety. Uh, like I said, make sure that your first four pages or so are focusing entirely on construction, at least your first four pages. I mean, you can stick to construction the whole way through. I, that's great, frankly. But I'm assuming that some of you will want to venture into texture. And again, don't worry if your textures don't come out right immediately, because it takes a lot of practice. It takes training with observation, uh, learning to deal with those patterns, and it'll develop probably a lot slower than construction. But again, construction is way more important. And as always, if you are looking for a critique from me, you can receive that through Reddit by clicking on the, uh, the View Homework Submissions on Reddit button. And uh, the you just post your homework here, uh, include a link to an album hosted wherever. Uh, usually we use Imager. But if you are going to if you do want to critique, you have to make sure that you complete the prerequisites. So for this lesson, that's lesson two, uh, one, two, and three. And also make sure that you complete, uh, complete the lesson with the required tools. So here that's felt it pens only. I know for lessons one and two, I allow ballpoint pen, although it's not really recommended. Here, with lessons three and four, you have to use felt tip pens, ideally uh, five millimeter tips. It's just going to give you the, the uh, kind of the, the darkness of the line. It, it doesn't fade as much as uh, ballpoint, pen, ballpoint pens do. And so you're kind of forced to deal with all your mistakes and Ultimately, you don't want to try and draw as though you're drawing with a pen or a pen. I mean, as a, if you're drawing with a ballpoint pen or a pencil, it's a different tool. It has different results. You want to embrace the fact that it has very strong darks. You want to push those darks. You don't want to rely on hatching to fill in areas that should be solid black. You should just fill them in. Although sometimes it's better to do that with a brush pen. So those are also good to pick up. Anyway. So that's about it, and hopefully you won't have too much trouble with this lesson.